Okay, so this mini lecture is going to look at the difference between scalars and vectors and how we're going to use them in our study of physics, especially as you prepare for that MCAT. And also, how we do some of the mathematical manipulation of vector quantities, which is very different than what we've learned in terms of mathematical algebra manipulation of scalar quantities. So first, let's just start with the difference between a vector and a scalar quantity. Both are going to be important in our study of physics, and they're going to represent different types of physical, um, object, physical identities. A scalar quantity is one that contains only a magnitude. The only thing that is needed to describe the physical quantity is a number, a size, a magnitude. Something like temperature is an example of a scalar quantity in physics, or mass. There's only a physical amount, there's only a magnitude, only a number. A vector quantity, on the other hand, has both a magnitude and a direction. In this case, we not only care about how large the physical quantity is, how much of the physical quantity there is, but the direction associated with that amount. So something on the order of force, something like a force. How strong is that force and what direction is that force being applied would be an example of a physical quantity that's a vector. Now what we're used to in our, in our traditional study of mathematics is scalar quantities. When we do mathematics, algebra in particular on scalar quantities is the type of math we learned in our kind of long history of studying math. We add numbers together, for example. We do algebraic manipulations in that traditional sense of adding numbers together. But if we're going to do mathematics with vector quantities, we have to pay a different attention to different things. We have to be careful about the processes we use because vector mathematics is different than scalar mathematics. So I just want to give a brief overview of the different types of vector mathematics that you're going to see in physics. And then there's other videos in this series as well as in the normal Hopped Up On, Hopped Up on Physics playlists that do really great um, in detail about that vector mathematics and really good practice problems. So we're going to do a great overview right now and then I'm going to direct you to some of those additional videos to get a more in-depth look as well as some example problems. All right, well, let's start with that first basic mathematical operation we learned when we were learning scalar mathematics, vector addition. And like we learned with our scalar experience, vector addition and vector subtraction are very similar to one another. So we're going to start with vector addition, and then I'll describe how this vector subtraction can be taken from that. There are two methods for vector addition. The first method that we're going to talk about is the graphical method. This is also known, whoop, also known as the tip-to-tail method. Now, in order for, to, for us to do a graphical method for vector addition, we have to be able to represent our vectors as a picture. And vectors, something that has both a magnitude and direction, is best represented by an arrow. So if I were going to have this vector, we'll call this vector C. If I have this vector C, the length of my vector C corresponds to the magnitude of vector C. So the length of my arrow represents the magnitude of that vector. Direction was also important in vectors. And when we think about the direction of a vector, we need to define the coordinate system in which the vector is living. And so we could use polar coordinates, and we will in some cases. Typically, we will use the Cartesian coordinate system. So if I draw a Cartesian coordinate system onto my picture here, so that's my, you know, X, Y, Z coordinate system where those three planes are orthogonal with one another. And here is my X and Y as I have drawn it that way. The way we traditionally, and the way that I will continue to do examples for you, to define the direction of that vector is relative to the positive X axis. So if I am looking at the angle of this vector, 
I would draw that angle with respect to the positive x-axis. Now there's some example problems that deviate from that method to give you a perspective of all the different ways that we can do vector addition in terms of how we visualize uh, the vector themselves. But traditionally, my method is to use the positive x-axis. So if we're dealing with the graphical tip-to-tail method, we have to represent our vectors as arrows with a tip and a tail. So the head of the arrow is the tip of our arrow, the base of that, the bottom, the back of that arrow is the tail. All right, so if I am going to do vector A plus vector B, giving me a result in vector I'm going to call C. Now I'm representing these vectors by putting a small little arrow on top of my variable. The tip to tail method, is like this. And I'll just do a quick example of that tip to tail method. Again, there's a mini lecture specifically on this, as well as a bunch of practice problems. So this is my vector A, and this is my vector B, and I want to add those two vectors together. I take vector B and I put it on the tip of vector A. The tail of vector B goes to the tip of vector A, in a pictorial representation. And then to get result in vector C, I draw a line from the tail of vector A to the tip of vector B. So this is my result in vector, vector C. That's our tip to tail method. Now I can use the tip to tail method also to do vector subtraction. So instead of A plus B, imagine that I wanted to do A minus B. So vector A minus the same vector B is now going to equal my resultant vector C. Well, remember from our studies of scalar mathematics, a negative, a subtraction is simply an addition of a negative number. Well, in vector mathematics, that subtraction idea works as well. But what we have to keep in mind is that this is an opposite vector. So what does an opposite vector mean? Well, an opposite vector means it's a vector of the exact same length, but in a direction completely opposite to what it originally was, 180 degrees different. So my vector B was pointing to the right. My negative vector B will be of the same magnitude, but pointing to the left. So once I have this in summation form, I can then apply the tip of, or the tail of my vector B to the tip of my vector A. So I will go ahead and do that. And again, oops, that was not a good representation of vector A. So here is my vector A. My negative vector B now looks like this, where I take my tail to the tip. There's my vector B. And as I did with vector C, I draw from the tail of A to the tip of B. So there's my result in vector, both done through the tip to tail method. Again, there's another little mini lecture on that in your playlist and some practice problems. The second method of vector addition or subtraction is what we call the component method. It's also known as the algebraic method. All right, lots of erasing. So the component method is when we recognize that vectors can be broken down into their orthogonal components. So the first thing we do in the component me method is we get the vectors into their components, their orthogonal components. Oops, components. So how does that look? Well, here is my vector C. Vector C points to the right, so it has a component, a portion of it, that is in the rightward direction. That is the, in my Cartesian system, the x direction. It also has a portion that goes up. It's up and to the right. So 
So a portion of it that is in the vertical direction. So we'll say that that's my y direction in my Cartesian system. There are ways to get these exact magnitudes of these vectors within those particular dimensions. And there's a great video on how to do that and some good practice problems. Once I'm in an individual dimension, the direction is no longer a factor in my vector. I'm only looking at vectors in one dimension. And so they can now behave like scalars. So I can break them into their components, do my scalar mathematics within those components, So if I am adding the horizontal or the x direction components of all my vectors, I can just simply add those up like I would as if they were scalars. If I had all of the y, the vertical components of all my vectors, I could add those up as if they were just scalars. I then take those total components, all of my x's and all of my y's, and I put them back into vector form. So I take my components and I turn it back into a vector. When I'm dealing with two components, that's really straightforward using the Pythagorean theorem. And again, there's videos and practice problems on that. But the idea is that with the component method, I have to break things up so that they get into what we call their unit vector form, the vectors that only relate to a single dimension typically use that Cartesian system, so the x, y, and z direction. You will also see that represented as the i, j, and k directions. We get them into their unit form, and then we can do our scalar math on them, because direction now is um, a mute point since it's only in a single dimension, and then we put them back in vector form. All right, so two great methods to do vector addition. Now what about vector or subtraction? We can do the same thing with the component form with subtraction. We're just dealing with the opposite direction as I've shared before. What about uh, excuse me, multiplication? So with a vector multiplication, we also have two options. Now before I get to the discussion of multiplying two vectors together, I want to mention what happens when we have a vector multiplied with a scalar. What happens when we have a vector and a scalar in our multiplication? All right, so if I have my vector A and I want to multiply a number three times a vector A, and I will represent that vector again by putting that little hat over it. I simply have now increased the magnitude only of that vector. So this now becomes three times the length, three times the magnitude of vector A. So if this is vector A, this is vector 3A. So a scalar simply increases the magnitude of my vector. All right, that one's pretty straightforward, but what about if I multiply two vectors together? The multiplication of two vectors can have two different results, depending on how we multiply them. So the first one that I wanna talk about is when I multiply two vectors together and I result in a scalar quantity. This is what is known as the dot product. So two vectors turn into a scalar. When might we use something like that? Well, the physical quantity work is exactly that result. Two vectors, a force vector and a displacement vector, come together, multiply together to give us the amount of work that an object experiences. That's done through the dot product. It's represented by literally a dot. <laughs> so A dot B is going to give me my product C. Now that product is a scalar quantity. So A dot B results in the scalar quantity C. And because it's a scalar quantity, it only has a magnitude. So we only actually have to worry about the magnitudes. 
So how do I get this actual result in vector C? Well, I multiply the magnitude of vector A, that's going to be important. The magnitude of vector B is going to be important. I multiply them, those two together. But the angle, these directions also have an importance in terms of the dot product. And so we obtain that factor by multiplying our magnitudes by the cosine of the angle between vectors A and B. This gives us the quantity C in a dot product. And again, an example of this is the physical quantity of work. All right, you can watch that. Oh, there's a very brief mini lecture on that dot product, which covers that material again and then goes through an example problem. What about if I want to multiply two vectors together and get another vector? Well, that also is a process. That process is called the dot product. Uh, not the dot product, we just did the dot product. That process is called the cross product. And a physical quantity that this is important for is something like torque, where the torque is also a vector quantity that's the resultant of a force vector and a radius vector. So how do we represent the cross product? We represent it with a little x. That is why we will often use that to represent multiplication. In a scalar world, we use an asterisk, or we might use two parentheses next to each other or just two letters next to each other as we move forward. The cross product of A and B results in a vector C, and in this case, C is a vector. So again, magnitudes and directions must be important, and we must end up with both a magnitude and a direction of our vector C, our resultant, our product here. So to get the magnitude of vector C, we take the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B, and now we look at the relationship between the two. And in this case, it's the sine of the angle between A and B. That will give us the magnitude of vector C, the amount, the strength. But vector C also has a direction. Now the direction of vector C will also be, orth will be orthogonal, to, orthogonal to the directions of both A and B. And to get that specific direction, we use what's known as the right-hand rule. So right-hand rule. That does require us to use our right hand <laughs> to use it. And in the case of this um, light board, that's gonna be a little tricky to represent because my right hand now appears as a left hand to you on the video. But we'll just talk through it in the examples that we do in those subsequent videos. So we, there are three methods of the right hand rule that, might, that you might choose to be most comfortable with. I'm most comfortable with one that I learned as, as a student, but others have learned other methods and there are three. I will share each one of those with you. You'll see in that video. Again, kind of walking through it because it'll look like the left hand when it's really the right hand. And then you'll have to choose which one you're most comfortable with doing. But as a reminder, that vector C will be orthogonal to the two. And that, that is what makes our right hand work so well, a hand in general work well. One of the physical quantities that we use this for, like I mentioned, is the quantity of torque. So we'll be doing a lot of that right hand rule in terms of getting that angle and using that direction uh, to find the torque. All right, so multiplication of vectors can result in two different products, one that results in a scalar quantity C and one that results in a vector quantity C. And how you do that mathematics is going to look a little different. The magnitudes of each of those vectors are, of course, important, and how that angle is involved is going to be important as well. All right, I encourage you to look at those practice problems, review some of the mini lectures associated with these things. Again, this is just an overview as we think about the mathematics we're going to be using in our study of physics. Great job.